Listen without being defensive and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. It becomes personal and an eye for an eye means everybody goes blind. We have got to knock it off. We've got to learn to love each other because it's the only self-renewing energy on the planet. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to have John Hope Bryant on the Walker Webcast today. Let me do a quick bio of John and then uh, I will jump into my discussion with him. I will warn people at the, at the, at the top of this discussion that John and I had a 15 minute pre-call yesterday that ended up lasting for 52 minutes. Um, and so uh, something tells me the two of us are going to dive in pretty deep here and have a great conversation. Uh, John O'Brien is an American financial literacy entrepreneur and businessman. Brian is the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of the nonprofit Operation Hope. He is chief executive officer of Bryant Group Ventures and the Promise Homes Company, the largest for-profit minority-owned single-family rental homes operator in the United States. He is also co-founder of Global Dignity, an advisor to businesses and governments, and author of best-selling books on economics and leadership, such as Up From Nothing and How the Poor Can Save Capitalism. He served as a member of the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability, Vice Chair of the U.S. President's Advisory Council on Financial Literacy, and Chairman of the Committee on the Underserved. He has also received an honorary doctorate degree from Paul Quinn College in Dallas, Texas, the Crystal Heart Award from the University of Southern California School of Social Work, was named the 2016 Innovator of the Year by American Banker Magazine, and is currently the first Entrepreneur Scholar in Residence at Clark Atlanta University. So John, I could keep going on that bio, as you well know, with lots of other awards and recognitions that you've gotten. I watched a number of your speeches on YouTube and getting ready for this discussion, and you are such an inspiration in so many different ways. Um, your speech at the Global Dignity Day in Norway in 2011, where Reverend Desmond Tutu was sitting in the front row, to anyone who has some time after potentially listening to this discussion, I would strongly suggest you go listen to that speech because it is clearly, truly something else. But there are two true gifts you have, John. One is you're an amazing storyteller. And the second is that you remember a lot of facts. When did you realize that you were smart? Um, first of all, I'm honored to be with you. And what you didn't say, uh, Willie, is a, the biggest credential I've got here is that you and I are new friends. Uh, you're stuck with me for life, which I feel sorry for you. Uh, and to underscore the fact that we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience and that energy matters, relationship, capital matters almost more than everything other than culture. Um, I met you through Sean Horowitz, another sweet, amazing, brilliant soul. And I met Sean through Clayton Wyatt, um, uh, who's a genius. Uh, in, um, he is. Indeed, and, he is. And that trajectory was tied to a business uh, of mine that we're now growing. But it's all because we really liked and respected each other, not just because the numbers worked. And um, that was more relationship than transaction. And I feel like I've known you forever because you have this authenticity about you. I told you when we talked earlier that, you know, you're just normal and it's very abnormal to be so successful and to be normal. And I just want to underscore and commend you. You were raised well. Parents did a really good job with you. Um, I respect. I'm you. seeing them. I'm seeing them after we're done with this today. And so I will actually they both said they were going to watch today, but uh, I will relay that to them. It's very kind of you to say that. Um, and, and so, uh, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just being accurate. I mean, they, they, they did a, they did a really good job and, and, uh, you know, success amplifies who you are. You grew this company from 50 million to, to 5 billion and one of the fortune 500s fastest growing companies consistently now publicly traded and outside success, um, and three X, the revenue, et cetera, et cetera, and still kept your integrity about you still a nice guy and success and failure money and power amplifies your jerkdom <laughs> or your well or your niceness if you're a, if you're a jerk 
money and power makes you a really powerful, wealthy jerk. If you're a nice person, it just makes you an incredibly nice and warm, wealthy individual who does more for the world. And you're the latter. My mom um, told me, I, I, I don't think I've ever said this on publicly before. Uh, my wife knows, a couple of my friends know it. My, my mom told me when I was uh, uh, in elementary school that I passed some kind of a test that said I had a genius IQ. And uh, this is Compton, California, so they didn't keep good records. Um, and uh, luckily for me, it fought, it, it, the records fell away, the memory fell away, so I didn't keep it in my conscience. I just knew that I had to hustle every day because I didn't, I never trust fund or a hookup or I didn't know Willie yet or Sean yet or Tony Restler yet or whatever. So I just had to hustle. That was my hustle, hustle. <laughs> and, um, and that became my moniker is get up uh, early, work late, uh, forget lunch. And, you know, uh, an entrepreneur works 18 hours, they keep getting a job. So I, I, God gave you two ears and one mouth. So you listen twice as much as you talk. So I've always just been really curious, like Quincy Jones, how'd you get so smart? I'm just nosy as hell. That's what I asked him. I'm really nosy. Uh, but I think the key, Willie, is my mother told me she loved me every day of my life. There's nothing more powerful than your mother telling you that you are loved. And so I've said this quote uh, at Operation Hope over the years is the difference between being broke and being poor. Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind, a depressed condition of your spirit, and you must vow never, ever, ever to be poor again. And so I've been homeless, as you know, I was homeless, I lived in my Jeep for six months, a Jeep that was payments weren't made on, so they were chasing the Jeep. Um, uh, I lived in that for six months. I, I failed repeatedly from 18, from age 10 to 18, 20 years old. Um, I've had lots of failure, but success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I take no for vitamins. I think it's not so much about being smart, it's about being resilient. There's a lot of smart people out here. There's a lot of people who are very learned, uh, but they don't have good common sense. They don't maybe, maybe have high confidence, but low self-esteem, right? And it's probably the most dangerous person in the world beyond the person with no hope, really, is a person with power, money, position, confidence, confidence means you have competence and low self-esteem and fear and insecurity. Hmm. Now, I'm not going to name a name, but people yeah, listening to this, watching this can, say. can get an image of a few people I just mentioned, a, a few people who describe, for whom what I just described, describe. And this fact, you don't need to say, you don't need to describe any, but you don't need to say a name. It just sort of jumps out at you. And uh, I think in that way, the world's dangerous and you got to handle people like their emotional hand grenades because you, you walk in every situation uh, that can implode or explode or, uh, or possibly blossom with potential that you can nurture their fundamental goodness. And I think I'm resilient. I think uh, I see the glasses half full, not half empty. I never give up and I see possibilities in everybody. And I try to nurture those possibilities. So let me back up. You, you mentioned a number of different things that were fundamental to your upbringing. Your mother letting you know that she loved you every day, which is just so powerful. Um, but you also said during that time when you were growing up in Compton that you were surrounded by prison, probation, and parole, the three Ps. Um, and yet when you were 10 years old, you started a candy store <laughs> because the local liquor store owner didn't want to listen to your suggestions about what candy to actually carry and so you got the right candy and you got the um you understood what buying wholesale and selling retail was all about and you start up your own candy store but someone asked you how did you have the gumption how did you have the confidence to start it and you commented it never dawned on me that i couldn't right that's unusual that question doesn't happen unless what you did is unusual as a 10 year old to have the confidence to go do it. So what was it beyond your mother telling you she loved you every day and beyond maybe prior to that or after that being told that you had a really high IQ that said to you, huh, I ought to go do it? I, I, I think that, uh, that you're asking the most important question probably for, uh, I mean, probably the most important question been asked of me of any interview even before the pandemic because it's everything. 
Um, this book, Up From Nothing, I wrote, the last one, I've written five, um, three of them bestsellers um, and in business. And this one, I tell a story of a guy named Mike Maples. Mike Maples Jr., his dad was president of Microsoft Products and Services. But so the short story is I was with Mike and I said, Mike, how, how'd you get here? He's a big venture capitalist, very successful. Oh, uh, nothing. No, no, tell me about your parents. Oh, they're just, oh, no, no, tell me about, well, my dad worked for Microsoft. Okay, more. Oh, you work for Bill Gates. Okay, everybody worked for Bill Gates, technically. Well, <laughs> he, he, he handled, he handled uh, uh, I think he said products, and he never, he didn't say he's president, right? Humble guy. Okay, get to the end of the story, and he said he had this, uh, this story to start, I mean, he had started a video game company at 12 years old, and it became pretty successful, Willie, and he went to his father and said, Dad, this thing is so successful. I think I want to sell this company to uh, Disney. And his dad said, I'm really disappointed in you, young man. Excuse me, son. Excuse me, Dad. Now, in my neighborhood growing up, Willie, if you have a 12-year-old kid, a 20-year-old kid, a 25-year-old kid who starts a business and is legal and is successful, you, you just apply, right? And maybe even where you grew up, I don't know. But uh, here's what I know about you, and here's what I know about me, and here's what I know about Mike, and this was different. Um, Mike's dad said, I'm ashamed of you. We don't think about that like that in this household. You don't create a business and sell it to Disney. You create a business to buy Disney. <laughs> Drop the mic. His father was building not a surviving mentality, not a thriving mentality, middle class the cashing checks, not even a winning, but a winning mentality, writing checks, building things, builders. A winner knew they were a winner before they won anything. A winner knew they were a winner before they ever won anything. Think about LeBron, think about any, any basketball player or a football player or a sports uh, uh, athlete you want to pick, pick up, think about you, your parents poured that into you. My, my, my mom and dad. So my mom told me that my dad owned his own business my, they were financially illiterate. My dad was financially illiterate. That's a different story. That's why I'm so passionate about financial literacy. We'll get to that maybe. But my father, who had me older at 54, he was born in 1921, I think. His dad was born in 1871 in Mississippi. Willie, 1871 in Mississippi, because he's probably born into slavery. Right. So my, my, my grandfather was a sharecropper, owned a farm, uh, and and that farm was worth $700 in 1921. Certainly my great-grandfather was a slave, without question. But my grandfather was probably born into slavery. So slavery, independence, farming, business owner, entrepreneur, me. My mother's, my mother's mother told, did not tell her she loved her. My mother poured into me that she loved me. And I'm all about love. My mother, my grandmother, barely owned her own home. My mother bought and sold seven homes on a, on a hourly salary from McDonnell Douglas Aircraft. I now, through Promise Owns, own 700 homes. This is not accidental, it's role modeling. You, grow, you think about an inner city neighborhood. Why do kids wanna be rap stars, athletes, and drug dealers? They're not dumb and they're not stupid. The kids are modeling what they see. If all you see in your neighborhood is symbols of success, are rap stars, can't model that because you can't replicate a TI or a killer Mike or whatever. They're individual personalities. It's not scalable. I love, I know these people. I love them as human beings, but it's not scalable. Athletes, same thing, not scalable. You cannot have 40 million black people trying to be 4,000 professional athletes or 2,000 rappers. Uh, and you don't want to be a drug dealer. There's no retirement plan and it's a business plan that kills. But that's what you see as symbols of success. And if you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. A lot of success of people watching this and listening to this podcast, and this is why I want to I love you so much, because you understand you had the luck of the gene pool. It's not that you're a genius. <laughs> you were born in the right family. You had the right DNA. You had the right soil. You know, Steve Jobs' father, Steve Jobs' father, Steve Jobs' father didn't want him. His grandfather definitely didn't want him because his, his, Steve Jobs was born, in, in, with his mother was white, uh, Jordanian father. Sorry, his father wanted him. Grandfather's like, no, that's not happening. You're not marrying a Jordanian dude. Get rid of the kid. So they tried to, 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 to get the kid adopted to a wealthy family that decided they didn't want him. 
got kicked to a middle class family that had good credentials in Silicon Valley by coincidence called Hello, the Jobs family. The rest is history for the rest of the world. But if Steve had been adopted by a single parent household mother in the South Side of Chicago, he'd have been his biggest drug dealer in the world had ever seen because brilliance is transferable everywhere. So you, you, after starting the candy store though, you did pursue entertainment and you did go into a career of acting and also a little known fact that I ferreted out, I don't know how often this comes out, but you're actually a dancer on Soul Train and American Bandstand. I'm not going to ask you. To really bad, Willie. I can I can barely hear you. I, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and do and and do what I've seen you do once or twice live on 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 video. But um, you did transition to that, and I think one of the interesting things about it, John, is this: you transitioned to entertainment. You were clearly capable and successful at doing it, whether it was dancing on one of those shows or actually being an actor. But when you were broke and you were living out of your Jeep, and um, as you have said, um, you know, when you're broke and on the floor, you can't fall any lower, which I, which I love in the sense of you only got one way to go, which is pick yourself up and go. But most people in that situation double down on what they know. Mm. So the natural move would have been for you to push harder on the acting and push harder on the dancing and kind of continue in that. But instead of doing that, you decided to become a banker. And you said, hey, hang on a second. I think I can go and actually sell credit. I think I can go work for a bank. And obviously, not obviously, when you went to the bank, the bank said, oh, great. Here's this really talented black guy. Maybe we'll send him to sell credit in parts of the city that we don't know how to penetrate. And you said, hang on a second, that ain't where you're sending me. You're going to send me to the entertainers who I know how to penetrate them and I can really do some stuff. But my point is this, why when you were down and out, when you were on the floor, didn't you double down on what you knew rather than changing and going for something that you didn't know? Uh, because without banking and finance, you can't grow communities. That capitalism and democracy are horrible systems except for every other system that democracy can be a force for good and, and capitalism can be a force for a transformational change. And it has been. Um, and every, all legitimate wealth came from capitalism and all developments that we see in the world came, including the technology we use today came from entrepreneurship, but no one gave black folks the memo on free enterprise capitalism, economics, and opportunity. There was a bank created by Abraham Lincoln after the civil war through the Freedmen's Bureau Act called the Freedmen's Bank, March 3rd, 1865, to charter to quote, teach free slaves about money, which was his attempt to give blacks the, what I call the Jewish experience of going from slavery and, and being, really being beaten upon and, and, and besmirched to really having their freedom and then setting them into a, uh, using their brilliance to, and that hustle to set into a free enterprise and capitalist system, teach them about money and let them unleash untapped GDP in America and around the world. Unfortunately, Lincoln was killed the next month. So you have January 1865, the, the 40 acres, we hear about that in the history books, that was built action 15, North Carolina, South Carolina, all the way down to Florida along the coast. Uh, we don't have time for the story, but it was beachfront property at a time of agricultural age. So really not very useful, but we worked that land so hard. They said, my God, they're so industrious, black people, give them a mule. January 1865, March, February 1865, the mule, February came, the, March came the bank to finance the land, and then Lincoln was killed in April. So we never got the memo on free enterprise, capitalism, economics, and ownership and opportunity, which is why we cash checks, Black folks generally, but don't write them. 96% 96, 96 of all Black businesses in America, 3 million Black businesses, don't have an employee, don't have books and records, don't have infrastructure, back-end infrastructure, can't get access to credit. Half of Black folks in this country have less credit score below 620 which means I don't care how nice we are, how many times we go to church and how, and how sweet we are, we're really forgiving people. We didn't even make this country pay a price for slavery or those who enslaved us, which is where I think this obsession with guns come from, but that's a whole other conversation that goes back 150 years. People want these, these guns everywhere, but that's a, we'll hopefully get to that, un, what I call unhealed American story, my next book. But uh, the fact that we never made this transition into free enterprise and capitalism economic opportunity is, the, is what I call the, un, finished work of the third reconstruction. We had basic freedom. We had get a job, get access. That was civil rights, the 1960s. And then we had 
what I call silver rights, which is which is economics, access, credit, opportunity, uh, banking, finance, wealth creation, cheap credit, to quote Tony, Tony Rester, Michael Argetti, uh, uh, in the 21st century, which is where we are today, social justice through an economic lens. I like math because it does not have an opinion. So let's now go back to the story you told about uh, candy shop, because all this relates. The question you didn't ask, and uh, and you should is why why was I not intimidated at or angry at white people? Uh, given I grew up in the hood, uh, given that the only police officer, only white folks that my friends saw were as a police officer shoving them against a patrol car, and that made them angry. Um, and the only white man I ever saw really with a suit on was a detective, and it was a polyester really bad suit. But when I was nine years old, my teachers who were white bought what I was selling on mail order, my, my mail order catalog. It was a positive experience. We, and then I had a white banker come in my classroom, first year of Community Reinvestment Act, 1977, to teach me financial literacy through home economics class. Now, I just told you Blacks never got a class in free enterprise economics and opportunity, uh, i.e. the Freedmen's Bank. Um, it failed and been lost to history. We actually got the free treasury annex building renamed across from the White House to be renamed the, tre the Freedmen's Bank building, which is it is today. But uh, this white banker comes in teaching home economics. He didn't want to be there because he was forced to. But after a, a week of coming, Willie, he's like, you remind me of my children. Tr translation, we're normal, just like them. Um, you, you know, you guys are not so bad. We looked at him where you're not so bad either. I got comfortable raising my hand, excuse me, sir, what did you do? What do you do for a living? And how'd you get rich legally? <laughs> and he said, young man, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. And I said, sir, I don't know what an entrepreneur is. I've never heard that word in my entire life. No one's ever taught me that word. I'm nine years old and I pay attention. But whatever it is, if it's legal and you're financing it, I'm going to be one. And I went home and opened up the dictionary. Young people watching this, listening to this, that's called a Google search today. <laughs> and I looked, opened the dictionary, French word, entrepreneur, build something, create value from nothing. Boom. That's what I'm going to do. Change my whole life. Endorphins kicked in my head where creativity, hope, well-being, the right side of your brain, hope, well-being, love, charity, compassion, joy, self-belief. And I, and I decided I was going to become somebody and break out of this poverty situation and bring everybody else with me. And I found that that worked. That's the story of me going to work at a liquor store. He tried to get me to sell candy. I said, no, I want to be a box boy. He said, that's the worst job I've got. Why don't you be a salesman? That's the best job I got, but I don't want to sell your stuff. I want to, I want to sell me. So I went to become a box boy to find out where he was buying and selling his product, how much it was, what was the markup. By the way, that company, Iris Food, Food Store and Smart and Final was bought by a company I later sort of the board of Aries Management, Michael Arigetti, Tony Ressler. So uh, quit, borrowed $40 from my mother, my banker, <laughs> bought some inventory, ate through half the inventory, ate candy to this day, sold the rest of the other, made $300 a week on a $40 investment, very much like you, Willie, and your number is there, and put the liquor store out of the candy business. Imagine, Willie, what that did to my self-esteem. So in one fell swoop, self-esteem up, confidence up, my relationship with white America, positive, my relationship with myself, positive, my belief in myself, my endorphins have all kicked on about belief. And then later on, just to answer a question you asked earlier, just get this out of the way. I realized this was not just about me, that money wasn't enough, that just buying another Ferrari or whatever was going to make me happy. I wanted to be about something other than just myself. And God had given me too many gifts to just be selfish about it. And so I realized I had a calling on my life. And I really believe, and I've said this very rarely in an interview, that if Dr. King was alive today, this would be the work he'd be doing. I think that we got to move from civil rights in the streets to civil rights in the business suites. Some issues of race and the color lines, the issues of class and poverty. The color should not be red or blue or black or white. It should be, how do we all get some more green? We are better together. And we got to knock it off and stop knock, stop hitting it at each other and knocking at each other and complaining at each other. Everybody wants to be an American, but Americans, we have to realize that we're at war in this country. I'm sorry, China's at war with us. They want to be us and they can't win in a fair fight. We're only 350 million people in a world of over 8 billion. We are an incredible force of nature in this country. But if we conspire against each other, the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. 
we have got to knock it off. We've got to stop criticizing each other. Critique, fine. Criticizing, no. And we got to find out how we can become, once again, this great mosaic called America. And that is my calling. My calling is the unleash the untapped potential of the bottom of the pyramid, which includes my poor white brothers and sisters in rural America, rural white America, to unleash two to three percent of sustained untapped GDP uh, and growth. And I think that will reduce the stress, lower the depression and increase the hope and really create a software upgrade on capitalism in this country. And I think we're sitting, Willie, in a moment in history right now. I want to go to that. The software upgrade on capitalism. I heard you say that and it caught my attention. You also said it in an interview on CNBC when you and Joe were going back and forth on capitalism and Joe was going to his lower taxes and typical kind of Republican mantra. And you said, Joe, you sound like a capitalist with a heart. And he honestly didn't know where to go. I, I watched it three times, John. And he's sitting there going, hold on a second. Is that a compliment or is that a criticism? And I thought it was so interesting your comment about capitalism needs an upgrade. And, and you, you did make that comment as it relates to collect it like a capitalist, capitalist spend it like a socialist. No, no, and no, 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 no. I said, you, even if you want to, even you do your research, but I'm, 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 I love your brain. Even if you want to distribute money like a socialist, Shimon Perez, God rest his soul, told me this in Jordan. Even if you want to distribute money like a socialist, you have got to first collect it like a capitalist. So I just want to make sure I am a capitalist, but but even folks who want to give it away have to realize that it's, it, it, it is accumulated legally through capitalism. And so today we seem to have this great divide between the purely capitalist society of just make money, low taxes go that way versus let's distribute it and use the tax code to redistribute income. And that inherent conflict between those two viewpoints today seems to be what creates a huge chasm between Republicans and Democrats. So how do you bridge that? Because that whole issue that you just clearly, if you will, refined my comment and corrected my comment is the sort of the, 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 the major difference between the two parties. And you have been so successful at working on both sides of the aisle. Your first presidential appointment was from George W. Bush. And there were lots of people who said, hold on a second to George W. Bush. Who's this guy? He, he hangs out with a lot of Democrats. And George W. Bush yeah, he hangs out with a lot of Democrats, but he thinks like a Republican. And then you go to various Republican confabs and they all sit there and say, yeah, he hangs out with a lot of Democrats, but he actually sounds a lot like a Republican. He just talks about self-will. He talks about capitalism. He talks about don't give me a handout, give me a hand up. So how do we bridge these two things, John? As you know, I've served Clinton, Bush and Obama from three different administrations, and we were honored by five presidents. I've known eight, um, and most of them are good people. Uh, by the way, Black America, who talked like a dog, talked like talked about George W. Bush like a dog when he was president, would beg to have him back today. Oh my God, can you bring back George W. Bush? He seems so reasonable, and and like he he makes common sense, and he's you know he says things that he you know actually based in facts and so on and so forth. You know, but it was back in the day when Republicans and Democrats actually talked together. His dad, George H.W. Bush, was probably the last moderate Republican. I really probably, I probably have a Republican head and a Democratic heart. That's my ideal sort of politician. I think that we're asking the wrong question though, Willie, because it's an either or conversation versus an and conversation. And we're talking about, well, you're going to take my money and give it away to redistribute distribute to somebody else. So the, let me just get this out of the way. If you take all the wealth in the world, distribute it as my liberal friends would want to every poor person, in the world, or just every person in the world equally, take the top 3%, redistribute that money to everybody equally, what will happen? In five years, the top 3% will have it again because they got the memo on wealth creation, not just making money, but building wealth, which is what you do in your sleep, compounding, and everybody else did not. So you cannot just give away Money. If I give nothing but do nothing, give a homeless man a million bucks and do nothing else, he would be broke in six months. So that's you've got to do more than that. To quote Andrew Young, my mentor, Dr. King's right aid, right hand in the civil rights movement, to live in a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. So let's now break this down real quickly. All my friends who say that they got here all by themselves, it's a lie. <laughs> It's just a lie. And they know it's a lie, right? They're winking at themselves. You know, I said earlier, if you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the 10th. It's also the opposite's true. Why do you go to Harvard? I know you went to Harvard. I've got, I, I've taken classes. I've got a certificate from Harvard. 
is it just because it's a great university with education? No, you go there because the class of 2022 is going to hook each other up for the next 40 years. For the same reason we go to, we members of country clubs, uh, private clubs, going to Sun Valley, whatever it is you're going to, it is because it is a fraternity and wealth creates more wealth. Relationships creates well, the relationships either move you up or down that stream. You can be dumb, blind, half stupid. If you have the right relationships, you'll still do well. You can be a genius uh, and poor, and you at best will be a drug dealer. Um, so let's, let's just knock it off that somehow people got there on their own. To be honest, it was the GI Bill in, after World War II that created the white middle class. And that was the government bestowing upon returning GIs um, a mortgage for a home as much education you shove down your throat and an apprenticeship for a new job. That's the government <laughs> redistributing somebody's <laughs> wealth, you want to call it, but I call it an investment. Now, 99% of that money, by the way, really went to white people, even though blacks fought in the war. That's a whole other topic for another time. We maybe do another podcast. I'll walk you through 400 years and four minutes and why we got here and why we are in this in unequal system we are today. But it, 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 but it created the white middle class, beautiful, good thing, by the way, it's a good thing. And that then created the foundation for the people below, above that to say, I don't want to work a business, I want to create a business, the kids. And then the, the generation that's saying, well, I want to become an entrepreneur, i.e. the freedom that we have today. What we need is an investment. We need, we need cre tax credits for internships. And I mean, at scale, I mean, tens of millions of dollars. You got to give a kid a reason to want to go to school. I mean, no, it's like telling somebody to eat their vegetables. Eh. <laughs> you know, you got to, how do we stop smoking? It's because the government said the stuff will kill you. It's on the back of the box. It didn't stop anybody. It's when successful people on TV were educated, college educated, whatever, weren't smoking cigarettes. Then people stopped smoking cigarettes. It was aspirational. You got to connect education with aspiration. Get, connect an internship with a C plus or better in school. Graduate C plus better, you get an internship from school. You'll just you'll see dropout rates uh, collapse and the graduation rates go through the roof. Internships, apprenticeships for those who already are in the workplace and need to be reskilled. Which we talked about the great resignation the last couple of years, but no one's talked about the fact that is the largest uptick in small business creation since 2004. These are not lazy people, Willie, who went out and sitting on their couch. These are people who said, "I'm tired of this dead end job as a waiter. I'm tired of somebody not taking care of my health care. I'm tired of working my to the bones. I got too much month at the end of my money, getting nowhere. I'm going to go invest in myself. The government gave me some stimulus money. I'm going to call it venture capital, <laughs> and I'm going to go start a business. So, and by the way, the biggest group amongst that, Willie." Black Americans, 38% increase in, in Black business creations uh, year over year. And the largest group amongst that, the number one group starting businesses in America in, during the pandemic, Black women. So th there's all these little jewels that we're missing. We're better together. Let's, let's invest in education. Having a dumb country stupid. We should have not K through high school, K through college. I mean, you need an educated workforce in a technology-centric world. Everybody, kids should get a, a course in financial literacy and a course in computing. Hello. Um, and, and college education, I don't say it should be free, but it should be a public good, not a private asset. So these are investments, and I've got much more you know, that I could spill out. The, there should be an obsessive, a, a literal obsession on creating entrepreneurship in this country, a generation of entrepreneurs because there's not enough jobs to go around. Uh, like we did 100 years ago. Goldman Sachs was two Jewish guys off the boat who couldn't get a job in the office tower. A guy named Goldman and a guy named Sachs selling financial services door to door, created their own business. That's now this conglomerate called Goldman Sachs. Walmart's the same thing. This, the UPS is the same thing. Jim Kelly, Kelly a bicycle and a, and, a, and a delivery route. We forget our story, Willie. We forget our, not you, Many, many people forget their own storyline, and we think we got here on our, on our own, and we didn't. It's a lie. We all need somebody. People listening to this, be honest now. You're doing well. You make six figures, maybe seven figures. Did you get your job on jobs.com? Did you get your job because you filled out an application somewhere and you got better grades than the person next to you? No. Somebody put their arms around you. Do you want an internship? You want a job over here? Hey, I think you do good at this. What do you think? Well, God, that's how you get your promotion, if not the job. It's the hookup. It's the relationship capital. And we need to understand that we're not, we need to reach out to somebody else who doesn't look like us 
and give them a shot to. So as you run through all that and you talk about relationships, one of the things that is immediately evident when you listen to you speak is that you have met a tremendous number of people throughout your very prolific career, but you haven't just met them. You've created relationships with them. You've followed up with them. You've, you've created real connectivity. I was in Detroit, Michigan with, um, we had an event on a building that we financed in downtown Detroit. It was the first conversion of a dilapidated office building into a residential uh, building right after the great financial crisis. Um, head of Fannie Mae was there. The mayor of Detroit was there. The head of Quicken Loans was there. And we had a bunch of kids from Project Destined who were also at the luncheon. And afterwards, we're sitting around and I'm at a table and our um, head of marketing, Susan, who was just on the webcast previously to say hello and get this thing going, was sitting at the table with me. Sure. And I said to these predominantly young black girls who were between 15 and 18 years old. I said, did you enjoy the day? They all said, oh yeah, it's been great, great. I said, who's the most important person you've met? And somebody goes, oh, I met the CEO of Fannie Mae. And somebody else goes, oh, I met the mayor. And somebody else goes, oh, I met the CEO of Quicken Loans. And um, I said, those are all very important people. Do you think you'll ever come in contact with any of those three people again? To which all of them said, no, 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 no way ever. I said, well, then that's not really an important connection. That's not an important relationship. Mm. But if you're able to get Susan's email address mm. and you recreate a connection and a relationship with Susan and can follow up with her when you're coming out of college and you can write Susan and you might be able to get a job at Walker and Dunlop or somebody else that Susan knows, that's the most important connection that you have. And all of a sudden, seemingly in front of me, all their heads kind of spun around and they said, maybe the most important person isn't the person with the greatest title, but the person who I actually create a longstanding relationship with. But you have done that time and time again. How do you do it? I love people. And I love you. I just met you and I just, I, I've got a man crush on you. I mean, you're, <laughs> you're, just, you're just a good dude. You're just a good dude, man. I mean, you're just a good, you're just a good dude. I, I, um, and it makes, it, it really makes me tear up. Like I just, I love meeting good people who, who, who are reasonable, who, are, who have an open hand, not a closed fist, right? And back, uh, uh, all these stories come to mind. So President Bill Clinton once told me, it's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth when the lie is paying their paycheck. It's mm -hmm. so hard to get people to do the right thing because all the incentives are on the wrong side of the, of the, of the balance sheet. And but what I tell people is, I tell my wealthy friends who, who may, who, for whom being a good person may not be enough to get them to change their behavior, my wealthy friends need my poor friends to do better if only to stay wealthy. My rich friends need my poor friends to, to, do, to, be, to, to do better if only to stay rich because 70% of this economy is consumer spending. Most of this economy are people with too much month at the end of their money. But that's who's holding this, the largest economy in the world up. But they're getting no credit for it. They're getting no investment. 97% of all venture capital goes to three states, the people for whom we already know. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying throw, throw that business plan out because, of course, success begets success. But where's the next Steve Jobs? Where's the next Robert Smith? Where's the next, you know, John O'Brien? Where's the next Willie? You know, where's, where, where, you know, that's what we should be leaning forward on. You, when, 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 we, when we die, we, buy, we die twice. You die physically and you die the last, sometime, the last time somebody mentions your name. And I just try to, I try to, point on people that you've got to live with something larger and more important to yourself. If all you do is fund your own life and fund your own obsessions, then no one's going to remember you when you're gone. Everybody wants a legacy. Everybody does. Watch how you live your life. It may be the only Bible anybody else reads. I try to reach into people and find a way to manipulate their fundamental goodness, pull it out of them, pull it out of them and show them that you can do better by doing well and doing good and being about we than just being about me. It's better to have a relationship than a transaction. It's better to build wealth than just to get paid and make money. So, um, so you, you it just use, and it feels better. You just use three sayings that all are so impactful. Okay. And one of the things that I've noticed about you is this not only in response to my question, you threw in statistics that underscore the importance of what you're saying. OK, 97 percent of venture capital in the United States goes to three states. Yeah. I didn't know that. 
But that then talks about where that money's going and who's getting that money and who's allocating that money. And oh, by the way, just as a quick aside, of all the industries in the United States that needs to have diversity and inclusion, it's the venture capital industry. And they sit around and they have a good talk and then you go look at who the partners are. I don't need to name Benchmark, Kleiner Perkins, I'm not trying to point any one of them out, but you look at the partners in those firms, it's a, it's a joke because they sit around and they talk about this, but they don't actually put their own money and capital behind bringing people in of a diverse background, women sure. or minorities, just but as by a the way, you put, you put diversity and inclusion in your proxy statement before it was in vogue, before but, the pandemic. I want to, that to me, that's so damn sexy. I mean, you, 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 you are making smart sexy. We've been making dumb sexy for too long. <laughs> but where, but where, where I was going on this, yeah. where, where I was going on this, John, is this, you, so Rodney King, 1991 or 92? Sorry. April 29th, 1992. 92. That was your calling to start Operation Hope. No, that um, was my re realization that I was a schmuck. Because okay, but hang on a second. Hang on a second. In starting that, and as you talk about why you started it, you say, you know, sometimes you don't have justice, you have just us. Yeah. How do you how do you come up with that? <laughs> Seriously, like, where does that come from? Because that is so encapsulating of that judgment that said that we all saw the video, we all know what the police force did, and somehow the jury says, nope, they're all good. That's just us. That's not justice. But yeah. by putting it that way, you encapsulate this incredible sentiment about what actually happened, and you do it time and time again. Is there some... I, how do you how do you test those? They don't just kind of I mean, they just kind of come out of your mouth and they just say, wow, that worked. I don't make decisions or or, or give speeches or whatever mentally. I do it intuitively. And intuition to me, again, I say we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. This is why I think the world's depressed. We've lost our way. We've forgotten that we're actually from him. Anyway, I think your intuition is God speaking to you and through you. I think that women are more connected to it because women are the creators of life. They're the only ones who can give life, but with, 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 it's like you're a terminal to a higher power. And so all my decisions are intuitive decisions. I just became reasonably comfortable to, in my own skin at an early time. I cleared the cobwebs out of my soul and spirit. So that is a very clear tunnel. And, I, and I'm very sort of calm in the center, no matter what's going on around me, it may be a you know, calmest place in a hurricane is the center. I've just always been very centered and, uh, and I'm relatively calm no matter what goes on in my world. And I make decisions from that intuitive place and my brain is a GPS device to get me where my intuition has told me. So when I'm doing business with somebody or partnering, it's an intuitive read. Uh, but the, to the larger context of that is, I've got one foot in black America, one foot in white America. I've got one foot in poverty and one foot in wealth, because that's been my one foot in Republican, one foot in Democrat, one foot in liberal, one foot in conservative, one foot in local, one foot in global. I'm curious, but I also has been my life experience. And, and so I said in 1992 to rationalize is to tell rational lies. And the lie I told myself, Willie, was that racism was dead. Because if I could succeed, then every this is the this is what kills me about these black Republicans, these conservative rep like Republicans who want to blame poverty on the poor or people like our Supreme Court justice who came up through affirmative action and then want to say affirmative action is useless. It is a lie. All affirmative action, I, I believe in the James Brown version of affirmative action. Open a door, I'll get it myself. Anybody giving you a job, a friend of mine, I won't name his name, I'll embarrass him, but he called me and said, John, during the pandemic, during this running, then the, the, the George Floyd aftermath, I want to hire two black interns. Uh, can you get the HBCUs there, historically black colleges, universities, to get me 20, 30 candidates from whom I can pick down, get down to two, interview those two to hire them? I said, I'm not doing that. I, I said, use the curse word, but I'm not doing your podcast. And he said, Why? I said, You're offensive. I love you, your heart, but your head's offensive. I said, Look, let me ask you something. When your biggest investor called you, and ask you to hire his lazy nephew uh, or his son-in-law or whatever uh, for whom his wife or whoever's telling him you gotta get to do the job. Did you put him through all that? Or did you just call him? Oh yeah, send him over. 
you just hired him because that was your largest investor to rationalize and to tell rational lies, right? And so, you, but you're going to take these brilliant people from HBCUs who are probably 15 times more intelligent than your than your your nephew or your cousin or whatever, and you're going to put them through all this drama. Tell 38 of them no, d- destroy their spirit and their self esteem. They're already uncomfortable. So you can hire two. Get out of here with that. Why don't you just do what you do with your nephew? Just hire him and see if he works out or she works out. Just fair change is no robbery. Treat them like you treat everybody else. Either hire them all or don't hire any of them. So th- that's the issue. I just want fair play. And I want us to stop the lie. And, and I think by having these honest conversations, starting with myself, and the re- reality was I had blamed poverty on the poor. I figured because I, I succeeded. And, and I, but I, my, my Jewish friend of mine who worked for me, Brad Billick, said, John, you're not, you're not, your experience is not a rare Black experience. It's a rare American experience. You had a mom who told you love you, she loved you. You had a dad who owned his own business. They backed you 100%. And now you feel like you can do anything. Stop blaming poverty and the poor. This is a Jewish friend of mine yeah. telling me, that setting me straight. And when the, and I, so I decided, he, Roddy King's going to jail. He did something wrong. But these officers are going to be in the next cell with him because they beat him on videotape. And officers got off because it was Simi Valley where law enforcement lived. And they were jury of their peers and they let them off. And I realized that I was a fraud at that moment that that I had that I had blamed poverty on my own people. And I had done the worst thing possible, which is to to get up the ladder and pull it up after I got there. So I closed my office down. I I was making good money, building wealth and went to my church. Uh, First A.M.E. in South Central L.A., I was devastated. I asked my pastor, what can I do to work? Do the help, but he was all these politicians there and community leaders. It was Jesse Jackson and uh, Governor and Pete Wilson, I think it was, and Mayor Tom Bradley, Republican Democrat. And he said, John, all these politicians can't build anything. Take your business skills, your banking skills, your finance skills, and put them to use rebuilding our community because the best way to stop a bullet is a job. Build wealth and opportunity in our neighborhood. That's what you're good at. I did a, I did a banker's bus tour the next week, put bankers in a bus tour like they were doing a uh, a, uh, you've done 18 of them. You've done 18 or 19. You didn't do them during the pandemic, but you've done them every year subsequently, correct? That's right. I just did one on the 30th anniversary of the Rodney King riots. Uh, April 29th, it was front page news of the LA Times, where, by the way, for the first time, Koreans and Blacks hugged the police officers and gang members, shook hands. The politicians, Republicans and Democrats, found a way to agree. Uh, they found out they were actually better together. So, in that, there's a, you know, you, you talk about a hand up and not a handout. And in talking about what um, Operation Hope does, um, you talk about the fact that if we create a homeowner, that's good for the bank because they need a mortgage. If we create a homeowner, that's good for the government because we've created a taxpayer. Right. And if we create a homeowner, that's good for the community because the community then has a new policeman on the street. Um, and and you, you use this at one time, you said your mother used to um, say to ruffians in your neighborhood, you know, you better back off my porch, underline the my, like get off my porch. And that sense of home ownership and that sense of an ownership society. And one of the things that I, I do think back on that, John, and given that you worked for him, um, but, you know, during the Bush years, we had the sense of the ownership society. And President Bush was a big, big believer in the ownership society. And what we ended up doing was sort of putting the home ownership on steroids to a point where we actually got the great financial crisis and we got a huge mortgage crisis and everything else that came out of it. How do we, if you will, make sure that capitalism doesn't go off the rails as we get really good ideas about an ownership of society going? And yet we clearly saw that excesses took it off the end of the cliff. So the, there was nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with a subprime loan. Let me start with that. Most people in this country are subprime, less than prime. That's all that means, right? Uh, the problem is it was a predatory subprime lending. Subprime lending. Intention does matter. Yeah. Right? When you try to take a, a, a size nine foot and put it try to a size six shoe, <laughs> and you put grease on it and 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 juice on it and squeeze it in there as well as much as you can. It's called a pick a pay loan or a negative amortization loan, and you don't give the people any financial literacy, and that you're interested just in the fees. Again, the Bill Clinton quote, it's hard to get somebody to agree to the truth and the lies paying their paycheck, and you're earning all these fees. You can rationalize almost anything, rationalize and tell rational lies. 
of course it's going to explode. And so then we want to blame poverty on the poor and say it was all a horrible idea. By the way, the number one group that foreclosed, that filed for foreclosure during the subprime crisis was single white men, not minorities. Again, another misnomer of fact. Uh, but the, the narrative was that, oh, these minorities defaulted in their loan. The reality was there's nothing wrong with capitalism. It's the greed. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the ready fire aim. What, what we need now is what President, what, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Bush actually should get credit for, a good heart, but he doesn't follow it up with a good head. President Bush was responsible, is a, has done more for Africa, as an example than any president in the history of this country before or since. He, des he deserves credit for that. But when I try to get him to do financial literacy for eight years, the urgent always crowded out the important. We don't probably have time for this story. You'll tell me if we have time, I'll come back to the story of actually I got this done. I did get him to create financial literacy as US federal government policy. Unfortunately, I didn't ask for money to back it up. So it's an unfunded mandate at the federal government level only. Um, but it's a cute story behind that. But today, uh, Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, and I are co-chairing financial literacy for all to make financial literacy the civil rights issue of this generation and to embed it into the business case to get Fortune 500 companies and Fortune 1000 companies <coughs> to embed financial literacy <laughs> into their business plan. Um, and as we've gotten Delta to do it for their employees, free financial coaching for their employees, UPS, free financial coaching for their employees. It's what healthcare was 30 years or 40 years ago. It's health wellness was 10 years ago. Financial coaching relieves the biggest stressor on, on workers today, which is financial stress while they're on the job. If they're on the job and they're thinking about their bills. And so uh, uh, we, we're going to get Congress to pass this, the Senate to pass it, the president to pass it, to hopefully bring this country together for something we can agree on. There's three, there's probably 300 years past due, certainly 150 years past due, which is financial literacy for all. That was a missing piece, Willie, is we yeah. didn't tell people, everybody's paymentized, man. What's the payment? All anybody asks, working class people, middle class people, they ask, what's the payment? Do you know you can finance an NFL ticket? Do you know you can finance a trip to the Bahamas? Do you know you can finance a hotel bill? I mean, this is people watching this listening should be stunned because this is not the world they live in. But you can finance a five thousand dollar prime Super Bowl ticket if you can't afford it. You may only make thirty five thousand dollars a year. You can finance a, a, a Hertz rental car yeah. charge. It's ridiculous. So we're not asking what the interest rate is. We're asking what the payment is. And poverty is not rational, Willie. If poverty was rational, poor people wouldn't be poor. You wouldn't have a check casher across you from a bank branch if poverty was rational. So we've got to sort of reimagine once again what our priorities are. Are we predators or are we builders? And because every place with this problems in this country, white rural and black and brown urban, here's what you see. A check asher next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent to own store, next to a title lender. Next, next to a dollar lender. general. Next to a Dollar General, uh, they're not they're not a bad player. I don't mind them being there. I'm not I'm not I'm not saying Dollar General is a bad play. I'm just saying that's the reality of what you see. No, you're, you're right. Pawn shop, uh, a title lender, literally lending against titles of cars and other things. Renting wheel shops, which is unbelievable. Yep. Renting rims yep. and a liquor store. I mean, in a church down the street, trying to make you feel a little bit better once a week. That's a 500 credit score neighborhood. All of our problems are concentrated in sub 600 credit score neighborhoods because 700 credit score neighbors don't riot, they go shopping. We have got to get the economic vibration up. Pop credit score is 100 points, neighborhood by neighborhood, the country stabilizes. I know that sounds really wow. simplistic. So your comment about not getting the funding for the financial literacy makes me think to a, a book that I just read that's a fantastic read. It's called Making Numbers Count uh, by a Stanford professor, Chip Heath and, and Carla Starr. And in that book, they sit around and they talk about how numbers kind of distort the reality. And they said, you know, there are a lot of people who poke at the food stamp program as being this great government giveaway. And it's a $68 billion a year federal line item for the food stamp program in the United States. More white people on food stamps than anybody else, by the way. What's that? <laughs> More white people are on food stamps than anybody else. But go ahead. Well, go. regardless of whether you think it's a white or a black program, the interesting thing about it is you do the math on what that is per meal. It's a dollar and 30 cents, seven cents a meal is yeah. the assistance that food stamps recipients receive a dollar and 37 cents. We should be honored. Even, to do it. 
even, even, I remember back when I was in high school and we used to go play sports teams. And when we would come home late, they'd give us $3 to go to McDonald's and have dinner at McDonald's on $3. And this was back in the 1980s. Yeah. And I couldn't stretch $3 to have a full meal at McDonald's coming back from a, from a lacrosse game. Yeah. The concept that it's $1.37 is what we're giving people who have food stamps, yet there's plenty of people who criticize a $68 billion program. It's sort of back to your, you know, the, the old saying, teach, you know, give someone a fish, they have a meal for a day, teach them how to, teach them how to fish and they can feed themselves forever. Right. Um, I know we're, I mean, I could keep going with you for hours. Um, we've only got a couple more minutes. I got a couple other things I want to touch on before we, we call it a day. You're not only incredible on all these issues as it relates to financial literacy, racial justice, building businesses, entrepreneurship, but you're also really, really good on the issues of sort of change leadership. And um, I've heard you speak about rainbows only follow storms. Um, I've heard you talk about loss creating leaders and that nobody changes when they're comfortable. They change when they are uncomfortable. Right. Um, and you're so inspirational on those issues, John. What's the, what's the loss that you have felt that has made you such an inspirational change leader? I think uh, the loss, I think that I was humiliated. I was, uh, this is, people can read this book up from nothing. It's about my failures, not my, about my successes. I think that, it, you know, success is easy, really. Success, shopping, <laughs> going on trips, that stuff's easy. How you manage failures defines who you are. Life is 10% what life does to you and 90% how you choose to respond to it. Most people who I know can't handle problems. And I don't want to be next to anybody who can't handle problems or a hard time. Um, uh, and you can go to military academy, but if the bullet whizzes over your head and you pee in your pants, you're not much of a soldier. So I think that it, it was the fact that I, I was homeless, the fact that I was dismissed, discouraged, even not just mainstream America disrespecting me or dismissing me, but my own, some people in my own community who were obsessed with civil rights, but didn't respect civil rights. Um, and civil rights is really important, critically important, but this country is not defined by what we're against. We're defined by what we're for. You can't just be an expert in racism. You can't be just an expert on, on discrimination and bias and injustice. Those things are really important, but you got to be, you got to, flip that switch and figure out how to build something, how to create jobs, how to create opportunity, how to create a tax base. And, and unfortunately, we've been so traumatized um, by our experience, African Americans in this country, it's almost like we're still enslaved, but it's mental slavery now. And I think that, that because I was able to escape that because of, uh, I was broke, but not poor, uh, I feel a responsibility. I, I was able to break through people trying to define me. Uh, I took the road less traveled. I had not just confidence, I had self-esteem. If I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'll make your life a living hell because whatever goes around comes around. So I have enough love for me and enough love for you too. It's okay if you don't like me. I like me. I like me and I like you, even if you don't like you or don't know enough to like me. If, if you get angry at me, that's not my fault. And it's not even your doing. You don't like yourself because you don't know me to like me. I don't mean you. I mean somebody that I just yeah. met. So my philosophy for living, my suggestion for people watching this is talk without being offensive. Listen without being defensive. And always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. It becomes personal and an eye for an eye means everybody goes blind. We have got to knock it off. We've got to learn to love each other because it's the only love is the only self-renewing energy on the planet. Everything else needs a reboot, a refill. <laughs> Everything else needs to. And by the way, badness comes from goodness. Badness has failed goodness. Darkness comes from light. The devil, the devil is a fallen angel. God gives the devil permission to exist. The devil is a punk. He's nothing. Uh, the, the, all things in this world come from light and light comes from love and love comes from him. And so we are winners. There's never been a movement over 50 years in length that's ever a bad people that's ever succeeded in the history of the world. And the world is 5 billion years old and life of human beings is 200 million years old. Never have bad people succeeded long-term. So you've got to be on the force of good because we're at war between good and evil here. And, and, and when, when you die, how are you gonna be remembered? And what's your legacy for your children? Because you got to watch how you live your life. Maybe the only Bible that anybody else reads. 
I, I know we're out of time. There's so much that we you and I could have covered. I and would we will. Like, we will one on one. I, I, I would like to maybe do it again or something, but I would like to leave people with this story of Robert Woodruff. I think I shared it with you, mm -hmm. if it's okay. Yeah. I want to encourage the private sector leaders here who say this is not my responsibility. It's not, I mean, it's like my, the rap stars and professional athletes, friends of mine are like, oh, I'm not a role model. Then don't accept the tens of millions, a hundred million dollars worth of contract. Just go play basketball on a court somewhere if you don't be a role model. You, you, once you take that contract, you are a brand. And, and, and please keep in mind, if you're a prize leader, leader watching this today, you are the change we need to see in the world because 88% of all jobs come from the private sector and all legitimate wealth. And the 60s, the civil rights movement was integrated in the South by the private sector, not by government. Government stood in the doors and said, over my dead body, elected officials. It was J.C. Penney, Woolworth, it was a soda shop, all companies who took down those whites only signs because it was bad for business, Willie. And we don't, again, we don't have time for the story, but that was Andrew Young going in, in, in behind closed doors and cutting deals with these business leaders in every town, you know, it takes down the whites only signs. And as we sit here today, I say diversity and inclusion is good business. If you want to find a company that's more profitable than its peers, find one that's, that has embraced diversity, inclusion, and, and, and openness and opportunity. Find want to find a region of the country that's doing well, New York, California, Atlanta, the South Coast. These are places that have embraced diversity and inclusion. Want to find an economy stuck on stupid? Find one that wants to argue about who goes to a water fountain or whether you know race is the issue or these other dumb issues. Memphis, I love Memphis. Birmingham, I love Birmingham. It was like, it's like 1960 all over again because they couldn't get out of their own way. Atlanta decided to argue over who got the contract, not what color you were. The color green was the color. So Robert Woodruff, the CEO of Coca-Cola, 60s. Coca-Cola was the biggest supply chain company in the world back then. Dr. King just won the Nobel Peace Prize. This reminds me of you, Willie, by the way. It reminds me of Sean, reminds me of a lot of people I've met through you. And the mayor heard that the private community, the private sector and community in Atlanta did not want to honor Dr. King when he won the Nobel. Oops, Dr. King's on his way home with Andrew Young. So the mayor calls Woodruff from Coca-Cola. I need your help. Woodruff comes in from his, his uh, hunting trip. He was upset. They brought him in from hunting. Get all these guys in my office. He said, now look, you pissed me off because you took me from my hunting trip. Let me make this clear to you. This man has won the most important award in the world. Pause. We're a global supply, we're the largest then global supply chain company in the world. Pause. I don't care if you don't like him. He's trying to create change. And of course you don't like change because it messes with your taxes, your wealth or whatever, but change is coming whether you like it or not. But I don't care about that either. If you don't want us to honor this man, we're moving out of this little backwards town, Atlanta, because we don't need Atlanta, Atlanta needs Coca-Cola because that means you're not progressive, but we are. We're part of the future, you're stuck to the past. You got a week. Either you sell out this ballroom or you're gonna have a problem with us. And my guess is most of you are vendors of my company. You got a week, goodbye, I'm going hunting again. So if you go and look at the, the uh, archives, the ballroom sold out. That's all anybody sees is that Atlanta sold out the ballroom honoring Dr. King. But that was only because somebody loved this country loved principle and values, loved right enough to stand for it. And that was Robert Woodruff, who by the way today, lives on through the Woodruff Foundation, the Woodruff Art Center, all the stuff still at Coca-Cola, his legacy lives on. And Coca-Cola, by the way, is still incredibly possible, profitable and was held up for 40 years by black consumers here in Africa. Uh, you can do well and do good. And with that, we all ought to think about doing well and doing good. When Walker and Dunlop, John, starts to back financial literacy, you're coming to our opening event and you're doing a soul train dance because I got some static coming your way when you were telling me I'm doing this and I, I got it when I was telling you about the soul train dance. So that's a deal, I hope. Yes. Um, we could keep going forever. We got to call it a day. I'm super appreciative of your time. Um, I look forward to seeing you in Sun Valley. And um, thank you for all you do. You make this world a better place. And I hope the two of us working together to do some really great stuff to move all these issues forward. Willie, your parents did it right. Tell them I said so. I will, my friend. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Take care. Peace and light.